Oh, I'm just doing a couple of things in the background here. Okay. Um, looks like we're about to go live. You got it. There we are. Charlie, do you see us live on YouTube? I got the uh, message. It went live, and I'm just bringing up okay. YouTube right now. So good. We're there. We're there. People starting to come in, and we're going to get started. Let's see. We go right here. Hey, Homer. All right. Hi, Hi right. Dean. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Community Church of Boston. We call ourselves a peace and justice uh, community since 1920, which means we are 102 years old. We were going to celebrate big time our 100th anniversary, uh, and then COVID kind of rained on our parade. Uh, so we are forever celebrating that we are over a century old, including this uh, wonderful meeting with this wonderful speaker, Jonathan Katz, this morning. Welcome, everybody. We're just glad to have you. Um, and I want to start, this is that, that kind of patriotic or, or anti-patriotic time between Memorial Day and July 4th. And I found just the most beautiful anthem for the ages written by a young songwriter. And I just want to read the I'm going to sing it. I'm just going to read the lyric. This could be a national anthem sung at baseball games. And it goes like this. Atlantic and Pacific flow, the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico. The land between sustains us all to cherish it our tireless call. Arise, arise, I see the future in your eyes. To a more perfect union we aspire and lift our voices from the fire. We reached these shores from many lands. We came with hungry hearts and hands. Some came by force and some by will at the auction block or the darkened mill. Arise, arise, I see the future in your eyes. To a more perfect union we aspire and lift our voices from the fire. We died in your fields and your factories, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees with an old coat hanger in a room somewhere a trail of tears, an electric chair. Arise, arise, I see the future in your eyes. To a more perfect union we aspire and lift our voices from the fire. And our great responsibility to be guardians of our liberty till tyrants bow to the people's dream and justice flows like a mighty stream. Arise, arise, I see the future in your eyes. To a more perfect union we aspire and lift our voices from the fire. I want to welcome David Roth to our meeting. Uh, it's not the first time David's been here. David joined us uh, for, for one event that was uh, about the uh, western water issues and the salmon on the Salmon River. David, among other uh, amazing gigs that he has, is a, um, a musical guide down a raft trip on the Salmon River um, about once a year. We happened to take that trip to celebrate my wife's retirement last fall. David was not the guide, it was Daryl Scott, but um, David uh, does these same, same events um, and um, among other great things, he uh, has sung for us before. And here he is again for us to get a, a full dose of David Roth. He comes to us from California. It's early morning out there for, for Musician's Hour. But thanks for joining us, David. And, uh, and we'll hear a song. My pleasure to be with you all. And here's a chance to sing along. So if you're sharing your Zoom room with somebody in person, you could look at them right now and say, I can't wait to hear you sing. I'm looking for more kindness in this world. I'm looking for more kindness in this world. If it's there and I don't see it, I guess I'm gonna get to be it. I'm just looking for more kindness in this world. Try that with me, here we go. I'm looking for more kindness in this world. I'm looking for more kindness in this world If it's there and I don't see it I guess I'm gonna get to be it I'm just looking for more kindness 
place in this world loving I'm looking for more loving in this world I'm looking for more loving in this world If it's there and I don't see it I guess I'm gonna get to be it I'm just looking for more loving in this world My turn Oh, this is what I see It's complicated A to Z And there's no quick solution Anyone is willing to make Even though it may be glaring It is time to be more daring And it's time to be more caring For goodness sake I'm looking for compassion in this world There it is I'm looking for compassion in this world if it's there and I don't see it, I guess I'm gonna get to be it. I'm just looking for compassion in this world. And I'm looking for more grace in this world. I'm looking for more grace in this world. If it's there and I don't see it, I guess I'm gonna get to be it. I'm just looking for more grace in this world. Oh, this is what I see. It's complicated A to Z And there's no quick solution Anyone is willing to make Even though it may be glaring It is time to be more daring And it's time to be more caring For goodness sake I'm looking for more justice in this world I'm looking for more justice in this world If it's there and I don't see it I guess I'm gonna get to be it. I'm just looking for more justice in this world. Grace, I'm looking for more grace in this world. Compassion, I'm looking for compassion in this world. Singing, I'm looking for more singing in this world. Peace, I'm looking for more peace in this world. Loving, I'm looking for more loving in this world. Kindness. I'm looking for more kindness in this world One more time I'm looking for more kindness in this world Yeah, David, thank you. Yeah, we'll hear a bunch more from David as the meeting progresses. But first, we light a candle. If I stood out in the rain night, my only light a candle a million miles away, would you lay down your fire as I raised mine? Would you I not kill it. again? And oh, when you're near me, oh my love, oh my joy, there's nothing ever to weary me, oh my darling one. The words of Cindy Callot. Mm. The song is called Rain Night. We wanna welcome here in our, in our audience, um, Couple of Smedley Butler Brigaders, Pat Scanlon and Joe. Tell me your last name, Joe. Cabanas. Cabanas. All right, and and, and Homer on your and Homer also, and and others joining us from Boston's own Smedley Butler Brigade of the Veterans for Peace. Um, we are so looking forward to to hearing more about Smedley. Um, but a couple of other things. Um, we are. Finishing out our uh, season of programs, there's two more left. Next Sunday is uh, Leonard Lerman, composer extraordinaire and, uh, of, of a classical nature. He wrote an opera about Sacco and Vanzetti. Sacco and Vanzetti, who are a uh, deep part of uh, community church's DNA, the founders of the church, founding mothers of the church, became very good friends with Vanzetti and uh, visited, him, visited him in prison many times, taught him English. Uh, and Mrs. Winslow, who's one of the founding signers of our, our founding documents, um, was actually in Italy visiting 
Vanzetti's family when news came in 1927 that they had been executed. Um, so it's become, uh, it became a, a, the first cause that the community church got deeply involved in to, to save Sacco and Vanzetti. And now um, we give an annual award. It's called the Sacco and Vanzetti Award. The most recent recipient was um, Julian Assange. And um, his father and brother were here to receive the award. And before that was Daniel Ellsberg and many others, uh, all the way back to the early 70s, um, William Kunstler and many in between, like Cesar Chavez, Mumia Abu Jamal, uh, Leonard Peltier. Anyway, uh, Next, next Sunday is, is a classical music concert. We hope to have a lot of physical attendees for two reasons. One is that we have a really beautiful piano and, um, uh, and music is not quite the same uh, Zoom as it is live and we invite you to be here. And the other reason is that following the concert is our annual meeting, uh, which is when we elect new board members and we take stock of the season that has just passed and we, um, we look to the future and uh, we find out about news uh, of our building, our programs, our members, all that stuff. Um, it, it should be a wonderful event and we <laughs> hope you can join us either virtually or even better physically. You, you also get a chance to, to see this mountain of books that we have in, inherited from the late Robert Dottilio to get a tour of, of our new office, temporary office upstairs, which we call the, the Sacco and Vanzetti Research Room, which has enormous amount of primary source materials on, on the case, as well as every book ever written about them. Um, so that's next Sunday, June 12th. Uh, and the last Sunday is Juneteenth, of course, um, celebrating the, um, the emancipation of the slaves, which didn't completely happen, but that's when it was celebrated, even though it was a month late when news got to Texas that they had been emancipated. And um, our, our um, speaker that day is named Gregory Williams. He's a retired um, district court judge from the, the, the Cape and Islands. And he has a presentation that's called Slavery and Segregation in Antebellum, Massachusetts, The Rule of Shaw. And we'll find out what that is. And our musicians are Matt Callahan and Yvonne Moore. They join us from Switzerland. Matt and Yvonne have just recorded an album of all abolitionist songs. And so it's, it's a, it should be a beautiful program to end our season and begin our summer and I can hardly wait, but it, it, you know, it's like really just a wonderful celebration of, uh, of the end of, of what's been just a great year of programs at Community Church. I also want to uh, point out to you that this summer, we um, have an event in memory of Carolyn Poinelli, um, a very fastidious attendee and uh, at the very end, member of community church. She didn't want to join for probably anarchist reasons or whatever during decades that she was uh, probably the most faithful attendee to community church, but she uh, did join like one year before she passed in a tragic um, pedestrian accident. Um, Carolyn Poinelli, and that event is on July 10th, uh, 1 p.m. That's on a Sunday in July, the Sunday after July 4th, I guess. Uh, so I, I really hope that a lot of, lot of the members of the church can be here for, for us remembering Carolyn. We will be joined by her three siblings, one sister and two brothers. Um, today is... I remember her. Somebody's, somebody's un, uh, mu not muted, but that's all right. Um, uh, today is Pride Day. And... Um, Pat has, has told us he just came from Arlington Street Church, which is completely festooned with, with pride, uh, pride, beauty, and grace, and elegance. And there's no parade, but we, uh, we celebrate our LGBT um, brothers and sisters and others. And um, I just want to say that I want suggestions from our congregation as to programming on LGBT issues in the next year. 
I just saw a program about trans health, um, which was doctors talking about uh, about trans kids and and about the horrific slew of cookie cutter legislation that is that is going on all over the country in red states against trans health. This is this is stuff that is just um, the medical is this should be in the medical realm and the science realm, not in the political realm. Uh, Roy Zimmerman talked about it well, his, his line, nature versus legislature. <laughs> um, let's, let's elevate our, our trans friends and, and, and make that a subject in, in our, our coming years programming. And I want you all to help me. We used to have in, in our building, we have a five story storefront building and our, our beloved tenant was, was called Theater Offensive. And they're, they're an amazing organization that uh, advocates for LGBT theater in the city of Boston and beyond. And they also um, had a, a group that was called True Colors that uh, rehearsed in this space and produced theater presentations. And um, we also had Bagley, Boston Area Gay and Lesbian Youth who were uh, met every Wednesday here. And this is, this is high school students mostly who, who came to be together and, and uh, have solidarity be, between each other and between us, the rest of the world. We've lost both those tenants. They, they got their own spaces. Theater Offensive is moving into a brand new building. They will have their own theater and, and their offices on a new, one of those new buildings that's just going up on Boylston Street, right by Fenway Park. <coughs> and Bagley has their own building, which is right in government center. So we don't have those, um, tenants and, and um, uh, who cohabit our building anymore. So we need, we need your suggestions um, in, in, in every way we can. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Um, I wanna tell you about an event that, uh, that I was involved in Friday night. It was an it was, uh, event in solidarity with Palestinian people. And, and it was organized by very, very young people. And I was there because we at Community Church uh, are not very, very young. In fact, <laughs> um, we're on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, and, um, and this was a, a wonderful, wonderful event, a bunch of very young and sophomoric sounding bands, but, uh, but also the, the, the highlight of the night was a whole bunch of Arabic people, Palestinian and Lebanese mostly, that, that led dubki, and I'd never heard that word before, but dubki is um, Arabic dancing, which is a circle and very simple few steps, and it was, it was just really a, a fun night and um, uh, and we have some some new activist friends that we hope to get involved in community church they're welcome to organize events like this in this beautiful space that we have a um, hundred person auditorium or so let's see one last part of our little churchy stuff before we get on with stuff with with things um, uh, our, our one paragraph reading from the, the work of Eduardo Galeano of Blessed Memory, my favorite author from Uruguay, um, uh, who wrote a whole lot in, in, in these uh, one or two sentence vignettes. And there's a whole three volume uh, set that's called Memories of Fire. And it's the history of of the, the Americas uh, from prehistory to now told in, in these uh, two paragraph vignettes. And um, this, is, uh, this is a book of days, which is, is kind of like what in my evangelical childhood, we used to read around the dinner table after, uh, after, after dinner, like for devotions. But this is, this is just some little little uh, pearls of wisdom from Eduardo Galeano. And this is for June 5th. Nature is not mute. Reality paints still lifes. Disasters are called natural as if nature were the executioner and not the victim. 
Meanwhile, the climate goes haywire and we do too. Today is World Environment Day, a good day to celebrate the new constitution of Ecuador, which in the year 2008, for the first time in the history of the world, recognized nature as a subject with rights. It seems strange this notion that nature has rights as if it were a person. But in the United States, it seems perfectly normal that big companies have human rights. They do ever since a Supreme Court decision in 1886. If nature were a bank, they would have already rescued it. And of course, um, Ecuador has since 2008 gone through um, some ups and downs where that those rights of nature were put in question. And of course, we have in front of here the poster that uh, that we uh, made for Stephen Donziger, who um, who is another one of our heroes who won that lawsuit against uh, uh, Chevron and um, for the people, the indigenous people of Ecuador and suffered greatly for it and just as out of prison. So uh, thank you Eduardo Galeano for reminding us of, of the people of Ecuador and their struggles against the fossil fuel companies. David Roth, I'm gonna put you back in the spotlight and uh, if you will join us for a couple of songs and I really appreciate that you got up early and, uh, and are doing this for us between some other UU services that you have later on in the day. Thank you, David. My pleasure to be here. You hearing me okay? Everything yes. good? Great. If anybody tells you there's no politics in guns and that now is not the time to change the laws, just meet the gaze of those who've lost family or friends and tell me how we justify the cause. It's well and good to send out loving thoughts and loving prayers, but by now these thoughts and prayers are not enough. All the good intentions and the cries to make a change must be followed up with action and rebuff. So change the laws, change the laws, change the contract, change the clause, change the mind and change the cause. Change the laws, change the laws. If politicians say do not politicize these things, or get caught up in the moment or in haste. I say it's precisely what we need to speak about before another single life is wasted. So change the laws, change the laws, change the contract, change the clause, change the mind and change the cause. Change the laws, change the laws. I will not be silenced, though the silencers abound. I will not be led by those opposed to common ground. If anybody tells you there's no politics and guns, they're the ones who know that money runs the show. And as long as nothing changes, they'll be happy and content, and they'll do their best to keep the status quo. So change the laws, change the laws, change the contract, change the clause, change the mind and change the cause. Change the laws, change the laws, change the mind and change the cause. Change the laws, change the laws.
I stand for love, stand for peace. I stand for joy and for release. For what is beautiful and true. I stand for hope. I stand for you. I stand for love. I stand for peace. I stand for joy and for release. For what is beautiful and true. I stand for hope. I stand for you. You know our world is in great pain. She needs our loving care again. But there are those who fail to see what we have done and what we need. There is a cost for every act and now there is no turning back. We burn a bridge, we bang a drum. It's time to rise, the time has come to stand for love, to stand for peace, to stand for joy and for release, for what is beautiful and true, to stand for hope, to stand for you. If you're thinking it's not urgent that we've got more time to kill, if I'm not the one who will change things, then for heaven's sake, who will? So I will move, I will climb this mountain one step at a time. I won't be swayed, I will not stop. Until we've made it to the top Where we will stand for love and peace We'll stand for joy and for release For what is beautiful and true We'll stand for hope, we'll stand for you For what is beautiful and true I stand for hope, I stand for you. David, thank you. That's beautiful. Gorgeous songs. Um, I want to make one more quick announcement. Tuesday night, 7 p.m., this same link is our, our monthly board meeting. It's the last board meeting before uh, the, the, the annual meeting. And um, just any members or guests who want to give us a little advance warning are, are welcome to attend the board meeting. Uh, it's completely Zoom. Um, I usually come down here because a couple board me members aren't aren't real versed in in Zoom, uh, so we're also down here at the church. But you can join us. Um, it's mostly a virtual affair, um, and we're excited to conclude our our year and take stock and uh, think about what's what's coming up. Some very exciting things including some uh, um, construction projects on our building that are um, complicated and, and intricate and, and interesting. Um, so if you're interested, Tuesday night, our board meeting, if you're interested also in becoming a member of Community Church and getting a, a, a window into what it is that makes us, makes us click, what are what are past uh, amazing past speaker series, different speaker every Sunday, different music every Sunday, our our present, which is what we're doing and what we're projecting about how we move forward and find new um, new new audience, new membership, new congregation, new stakeholders, and um, and that's our future. Um, so I've got this book in my hand. And it's called Gangsters of Capitalism, Smedley Butler, The Marines and the Making and Breaking of America's Empire. 
I first heard Jonathan uh, uh, interviewed on Amanpour. I, I don't remember if it was Christiane or uh, or um, one of the, one of the other interviewers, but it was it was it rung a chord because we have uh, Smedley Butler in in our in our list of list of heroes and list of people, and I immediately emailed uh, Jonathan and I I told him a lie. I said that Smedley Butler spoke at Community Church, and and Jonathan emailed back, "Oh, when did he speak at Community Church?" And and I, and I said, "Let me get back to you." And I went into the archives, which we now have a pretty complete record of the entire trajectory of speakers, 1921 through now. Um, couldn't find Smedley Butler, and it turned out uh, the reason I thought he had spoken was because in 1993 there were two actors who um, on a Sunday did a dramatic reading of uh, um, the pamphlet, which is called War is a Racket, that was written by Smedley Butler. He had, he passed in 1940. So it has to have been, it had to have been in the very early years. And I combed through uh, the entire archive and no, he did not speak here, but believe me, he was, he was on the same wavelength. Community Church of Boston was founded in the immediate aftermath of World War I as a response to the, the, uh, the collaboration of the mainstream churches in, the, um, in uh, recruiting uh, soldiers to, to, to fight in World War I and in collusion with the, uh, you know, the, the racket that that war became, the, the uh, the boon for for military industrial companies, in fact, the birth of uh, what Eisenhower eventually called the military industrial complex. Anyway, that's part of the reason why we're just so glad that Jonathan uh, is joining us. He's written this just incredibly readable book, um, biography of, of, of Smedley Butler, and it, it kind of goes back and forth between uh, the happenings 120 years ago or, or, or more, all, and, and some, some pictures into the, the present and the, uh, the empire uh, or the, the dregs of, the, of that empire in, in present day, let's say Philippines or, or Cuba. It's just a marvelous read. I haven't finished it. It's gonna be my summer reading and I'm just really looking forward to it. Jonathan, welcome to Community Church and thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I, it was very much in, in, uh, in, in Butler's uh, tradition, his tactical tradition in the military to, to, to bluff uh, your way into, into having me as a speaker. That's exactly, that's exactly what, what one, one, of the, one of the tactics that he loved to employ as, as a Marine was to, to bluff his way into and out of various situations. So, so we, are, we, are, we are fully in, 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 uh, in Smedley's legacy here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, I mean, you know, in case I, I know that there are a number of people here from uh, the, the Smedley Butler Brigade, um, and, and you know clearly, uh, uh, you know some of you are familiar with with the man, but just very briefly for for those who do not know, um, Smedley Butler was a Marine. That's the that was for his entire life. Uh, I think his the primary way that that he would uh, have described himself. Uh, he joined the Marine Corps in uh, 1898. Um, at the age of 16, he lied about his age uh, to join the Corps um, and uh, fight in Cuba against the Spanish Empire um, in what is generally known in, in American uh, high school history classrooms as the Spanish-American War. Uh, scholars tend to, to avoid using that term, sometimes <laughs> called the Spanish-Cuban-Filipino-American War. Um, and from there, he stayed in the Corps um, for 31 years uh, and, first of all, passed through every rank from uh, second lieutenant to major general, which was the highest rank available to Marines at the time. And he uh, twice was the recipient of the Medal of Honor, uh, which uh, is a very rare distinction to, to get one of those twice. These days, you, you pretty much have to have to die in battle in order to be awarded one posthumously. Um, and uh, he uh, served in pretty much every 
uh, foreign war occupation invasion that the United States participated in from 1898 until really the late 1920s, the early 1930s. He retired in 1931 as a major general, but spent the last 10 years of his life um, as a anti-war, anti-imperialist activist um, who, uh, as noted, um, wrote in 1935 a pamphlet, uh, War is a Racket, um, in which he basically gave a explanation of uh, how the United States became embroiled in the First World War, what at that point was the only world war, um, and uh, was spent, basically died in 1940 um, of cancer, uh, trying to uh, keep the United States from entering another world war. Um, he, uh, and also along the way, and this, this, is, this ends up being the, uh, 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 the, 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 the both introduction to and spoilers for, for those of you who haven't finished it yet, essentially the end of, of the book, or at least close to the end of the book, um, uh, in 1933 and 1934, um, he was recruited by a veteran uh, and bond salesman uh, to join what the bond salesman portrayed as a coup to overthrow Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, and Butler uh, testified um, in front of Congress, actually in front of uh, the, the, the pre precursor to, to HUAC, the House American uh, uh, Un-American Activities uh, Committee um, to basically you know, blow the whistle on this, this um, coup attempt uh, and was broadly mocked in the national press. Um, but uh, the committee found uh, in, in its final report in 1935, which was far less noticed, got far less attention than, than Butler's initial testimony, um, that Butler was they were able to verify, as they put it, all the pertinent statements that General Butler made. Um, it seems very clear, um, uh, at least based on the circumstantial evidence. And I can, I, if, if we have questions or whatever, I can, I can, I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, that 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 there actually was a some kind of embryonic coup plot to overthrow Franklin Delano Roosevelt for purposes of um, really ending the New Deal. Um, was was it was. Uh, a group of, of prominent uh, capitalists, uh, the DuPont brothers, uh, 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 Alfred P. Sloan, the, the head of uh, General Motors, uh, the, the, the namesake of the Pew Trust. A lot of a lot of big uh, uh, charitable foundations these days are, are run by people who were were, were uh, uh, have had at least uh, fascist sympathies um, uh, back back uh, back. In, in the lifetime of the people who the, who the, who the funds are named for. Behind every great fortune, there's, there's a great crime. Um, Butler, uh, and, and you know, as, as noted, you know, the way that I wrote the book, uh, was, I'm a journalist and I traveled around the world really, um, going to all the places that Butler uh, and his generation of Marines invaded, occupied, killed. Um, to find both traces of the memory that have been lost um, in the United States um, and also understand the ways in which uh, this era of American imperialism, this formative era of American imperialism um, has had, in, you know, has impacts up until the present day. Um, there are a lot of examples, um, you know, in, uh, in, in China, um, where Butler uh, in, invaded twice, first as a as a lieutenant in, in, in crushing the Boxer Rebellion of 1900, um, and then again in the late 1920s um, to intervene in uh, the what at that point at the beginning was the sort of small C Chinese Civil War, and and as he's there becomes the the capital C uh, W Chinese Civil War between the communists and the nationalists. Um, and uh, in China, you know, they use th this history of American imperialism in their country um, as a core of uh, a, a, an official story of what is officially called national humiliation or uh, the hundred years of humiliation. Um, and this is used, you know, to, to some, you know, to, 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 you know, the purposes of, of, uh, uh, of the Chinese Communist Party um, to motivate people to you know, hate the United States, see the United States as as a as, as a rival, and stoke uh, you know potential great power conflict 
in the Pacific of the exact kind that Butler was trying to prevent uh, in, in the 1930s, in, in his case against Japan. Um, in uh, Nicaragua, um, Butler uh, played a formative role in uh, the creation of uh, what ends up becoming the Sandinista party that is that is uh, uh, in charge of, of Nicaragua today, uh, and obviously was a, a target of, of uh, efforts uh, uh, to uh, interfere and invade and overthrow in, in the 1980s. Uh, for, for those of you who remember uh, the uh, you know, Iran-Contra and, and just the general Reagan administration funding of, of um, uh, death squads and, and, uh, uh, and other paramilitaries to, uh, to, 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 to try to crush the, the leftist uh, Sandinista government. Um, Butler uh, in 1912 leads a uh, charge up uh, a place called Coyotepe Hill um, in, in a, a war to crush, um, well, that was the Liberal Party, capital L Liberal Party of, of Nicaragua, uh, was trying to fight against uh, the uh, ongoing American occupation of their country and the uh, American puppet presidency uh, that was running their country. Um, Butler uh, and his Marines um, basically rout uh, the, the, the last rebel holdouts, um, the uh, head of those rebel forces, a guy named Benjamin Zeladon, um, escapes the battle and is killed uh, by uh, the, the, the Nicaraguan forces that are allied with the Americans, the, the, the puppet president's forces. Um, and uh, Zeladon's body is paraded through the towns uh, at the bottom of, of the Messiah volcano, um, one of which Nikimo Omo is the is the hometown of a 17 year old named Augusto Sandino, um, who immediately is radicalized in his telling and uh, declares uh, uh, you know a lifetime of of uh, revenge against uh, the United States and and to fight against uh, the the the, the uh, imperial menace uh, that is that is uh, ravaging his country. He is killed in another part of that that. Um, uh, 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 that ongoing occupation. Uh, he's assassinated by uh, the dictator or the, the soon to be dictator that the Americans, uh, that the Marines have trained, Anastasio Somoza Garcia. Um, and then in the, the 1950s, when another generation of young people, um, it's always young people, are trying to overthrow yet another American puppet uh, president, this one much more brutal than, than the first, um, they look back to uh, Sandino and the original Sandinistas as inspiration. And that's where the Sandinista movement get its, gets its name. And everywhere you go in Nicaragua, and I, I, I went there to, to report the book, there is, you know, the, the, the image of uh, Augusto Sandino um, as, a, as a symbol of, of you know, anti-imperialism and, and resistance against the United States. So th th there, there are examples like this in, in, in every place. Um, you know, the, the, um, the other thing that, that I, I found as I was, you know, writing this book, um, I'm a, I'm a foreign correspondent, um, by training really, or, or by, by, by the, the, the bulk of my career. Um, I first encountered, uh, Smedley Butler in Haiti, where I was, uh, posted as the Associated Press, uh, correspondent. Um, I was there, I lived there for, for three and a half years, and I was there on January 12, 2010, when, when the earthquake struck. Um, I, I was very lucky to survive. My house uh, collapsed around me. Um, a lot of my friends were not so lucky. And um, uh, I encountered Butler when I was writing my first book, The Big Truck That Went By, um, uh, about basically the ways in which um, uh, you know the United States in particular and, and other, uh, you know, uh, rich countries, imperial countries, post-imperial countries, in some cases, um, uh, basically continued the, 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 the forms of exploitation and predation that had marked uh, Haitian history up to that point. Um, and, and that is essentially, uh, you know, a, 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 a precious version of, of why uh, the, the response to that earthquake, in my opinion, and, and I think I, this is very uh, uh, defensible under, uh, you know, using evidence, um, failed, uh, failed the Haitian people. Um, and I encountered Smedley Butler there um, because Butler played a major role in the U.S. occupation of Haiti. Um, he invaded uh, with the Marines in 1915, um, helped set up an occupation that lasted 19 years um, until 1934, which until 2020 or 2021, 
uh, was uh, the longest continuous uh, U.S. military occupation uh, anywhere in the world until that record was broken, uh, you know, just a year ago in in Afghanistan, right, right, right before uh, uh, we withdrew. So I encountered Smedley Butler through Haiti, um, and uh, where, where where he is not well remembered, and he is known as you know like the you know uh, in, in Haitian Creole the most méchant, like the, the the most evil of of the Marines. Um, there's a a, a novel uh, that was written in Haiti um, about him or about about the occupation. It has a very uh, thinly veiled uh, character named Smedley Seton, who's a Marine, who's terrible, who's trying to basically steal the the, the Haitian hero's uh, love interest um, and ends up getting uh, uh, killed uh, by the hero who, who plunges a, 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 a bayonet through his neck. So that's what Haitians thought of, of Smedley Butler. Um, Butler then comes back to the United States. And the reason why I think, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about him today, and, and also one of the things that makes him such a, a fascinating character to, to write about as a book, um, is that he has this, um, I, I hesitate to call it a, a late in life uh, uh, conversion, because, you know, to some extent, these are things that are percolating out throughout his life. And, and some of it goes back to, um, you know, his, his deep uh, uh, moral roots as a Quaker. He, he grew up as a Quaker on uh, uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia's main line. Um, but, uh, but, you know, this, this, this latter period where he becomes a anti-war, anti-imperialist, anti-fascist um, activist. Um, and, you know, you know, w- one of the things that I was trying to figure out as I was doing the book, I had just, you know, a, 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 a surfeit of material um, both about, you know, but Butler, Butler's letters, he's a voluminous letter writer, um, other things that are, ha- you know, mm-hmm. other things that are happening in this history, the, the on the ground reporting um, that I'm doing. And I, and, 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 but I knew that I was going to, you know, I, that I needed to talk about, and I was going to have to occupy like, you know, a, a, a significant amount of material in the book, this last decade of his life um, in the United States, uh, when he, you know, for lack of a better term, becomes the Smedley Butler who who we know and love or or respect or whatever, right? Like the the, the guy, the Smedley Butler who was the reason why um, uh, the Smedley Butler uh, uh, you know uh, uh, veterans for peace or, you know, t- take their name from him, um, and also the business plot, this this uh, this fascist coup. And I wasn't entirely sure like how I was going to um, corral all this information um, and and make it. You know, comprehensible and, and, and put it together in in, in a single narrative. Um, and a couple of a couple of things happened that were that were clarifying for me um, over the course of of writing this book. So the first was um, that uh, uh, for those of you who who uh, don't know how how uh, how the sausage gets made in in writing nonfiction books, um, typically speaking, you get a book contract. Uh, before you've written the book in nonfiction, it's the opposite in fiction. Fiction, you write your draft, you 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 uh, work on it, you know, you you rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it, and then you get your contract. In nonfiction, it's the opposite. You you get the contract off of a a book proposal, um, which is usually fairly comprehensive, but you haven't actually written the book yet. And I got the book contract to to write um, Gangsters um, in 2016, and at the time that I embarked on this project. Um, I thought, like I think most people did, um, that the next president of the United States was going to be Hillary Clinton, um, and that I was going to be writing a book about sort of the rise of America's neoliberal empire um, as you know, neoliberalism uh, you know, reached its apotheosis in, in the United States. Um, and, you know, and I would, I would, you know, figure out, you know, how to talk about like, you know, the ways, that, you know, may, maybe the more insidious ways or the ways that are, are, are less obvious to, to uh, uh, less careful observers, you know, the ways in which um, this imperial project uh, has, you know, uh, affected and, and, and created America's wealth and has, has created the, the, the country that, that we live in today. Um, that obviously did not happen. So what ends up happening is, uh, I spend, um, you know, the five years uh, that I spent uh, writing and researching this book um, ends up being uh, the Trump presidency. 
um, or at least Trump presidency part one. Um, and, uh, and I see uh, it, all of a sudden um, what had been possibly a, a, a more subtle case about things that could happen in the future um, becomes a uh, exploration of things that were happening right now, <laughs> like right as I was writing the book. Um, and um, so that's, 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 that's the first part of it. What it as it turns out, um, as I'm, you know, as I'm writing the book, it is, it is being shaped you know, by current events. And this is one of the hardest things about writing this book, doing this sort of switching between past and present uh, was the past stayed the past. You could learn more things about it, you could go more in detail, but the present kept changing and kept, and kept spiraling out of control. And I had to try to keep, you know, following this and try to figure out like, you know, what is, what is, what is, what, where is this headed? Like, what is the, what is the end result? What is, what is, what is the thing? You know, I know that Smedley Butler's life, his, his life arc basically ends in, in the coming of World War II, this horrendous conflagration that he spends, you know, the last 10, really 15 years of his life uh, uh, fearing and warning about. Um, where is our trajectory going? Like, what, where, where are things headed for us? And it just so happens that as I am literally sitting down to write um, uh, uh, both the prologue to the book and the last chapter of the book um, uh, uh, that I'm going to talk about the business plot, uh, this, this, this uh, fascist coup that, that Butler blows the whistle on in 1934. Um, and as I'm going to talk about wars a racket um, and, and, and all of these things, um, <laughs> it is now the 2020 election and then as I'm really, as I'm really just about to, 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 to come into, you know, uh, com, you know, putting all of my research onto the page about the business plot, January 6th happens. Um, and January 6th was, um, you know, part of the reason why uh, people um, uh, had a hard time uh, believing Butler's um, uh, allegations of the business plot uh, was that it was unimaginable to a lot of Americans uh, that you could see in the heart of Washington, D.C., uh, an armed mob um, uh, converging on, you know, a major government building for the purposes of uh, uh, deposing a, a democracy. Um, you know, as, as Sinclair Lewis uh, you know, sar sarcastically titled his book, uh, which was, by the way, based in part on on Butler's um, uh, allegations of the business plot. It can't happen here. Um, and then it happened. Um, and it was happening right in front of my eyes. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the, the, the business plot itself um, took its inspiration from fascist movements in Europe. Um, it was a completely homegrown uh, American plot. There was no, there's no evidence, um, nor is there any need for, um, you know, involvement of, uh, you know, Nazi government in, in Germany or, or, or Mussolini's government in Italy or anything like that. But they, but it, it but it, it very expressly, and, and the bond salesman who, who, who comes to recruit Butler um, is very upfront about the fact um, that he travels in early 1934 to Mussolini's Rome, to Hitler's Berlin, and most importantly, actually, to Paris. Um, and this is important because uh, in 1934, six weeks before um, Maguire gets to Paris, uh, there is a event that is very, very similar to uh, January 6th. Um, it's called the Cease Février. It's even named for, for the day and, and, uh, and month in which it happened. Uh, February 6, 1934, um, a mob of uh, loosely allied um, far-right fascists um, and one revolutionary communist group, because you always have to have one involved, um, uh, stage a massive riot in which they storm, or actually try to storm, uh, the seat of the French legislature the Palais Bourbon, um, and clash with police. And the reason that they're doing that is because they are trying to keep um, a center-left government uh, from taking power 
um, because they allege a whole bunch of conspiracy theories, some of them blatantly anti-Semitic. Um, uh, but they're they are basically saying that this center-left government, um, these you know, this essentially Democratic Party of, of France, you know, in, in 1934, um, is a stalking horse for Bolshevism. That that this is going to lead to the the uh, uh, the communist takeover of the country. I actually don't know what the com the the, com the, the revolutionary communists. They were a very small group that were involved in this. Uh, they, they, I think maybe they were just sort of like maybe they, they knew that they knew that they were fighting against liberals. I think they, I don't think they were they they had that particular illusion. Um, this succeeds. Um, the the center left government, uh, you know, it's a parliamentary system. It's much easier um, to to unseat a, a prime minister, and and uh, uh, you know the, the the government falls, and a and a a right wing government um, takes power, um, and this uh, both helps uh, inspire um, the Popular Front, the the, the you know the the great uh, French. Uh, alliance between radicals and liberals, um, which is something that I think we can all learn from here, um, to fight against uh, uh, fascism, um, because you know the, the people who stormed the Palais Bourbon were were very clear of, about what they wanted. Uh, you know, they, they they wanted they wanted to to take over government by force um, and and implement fascism. Um, uh, it also helps th this this event and the groups that come out of this event. You know, a lot of these names end up becoming, you know, big names in in the Vichy collaborationist government once once the Nazis invade in in, in 1940, and that was what um, that's what Gerald Maguire wanted to have happen um, in in the United States, um, and uh, uh, and it is to 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 a great extent a, a model um, for what actually happened here on on January 6, uh, 2021. And you know, you know, as an intellectual exercise, um, you know, I, 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 you know, had to really sit down and think about you know, what does all of this have to do with one another, right? What does the fact that um, you know that that Butler, uh, uh, you know, Butler's whistleblowing about the military-industrial complex? And uh, Butler's um, uh, uh, articles that he wrote for the for the socialist magazine Common Sense, um, also in 1935, where he talks about uh, I, you know I was a racketeer for capitalism, which is where the title of my book comes from. Um, you know I uh, uh, you know uh, you know uh, you know helped in, in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics. I made Haiti and Cuba uh, uh, places for this uh, the, uh, the 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 National City Boys uh, City Bank. Uh, to, to collect revenues in, I, you know, uh, uh, made Mexico safe for oil companies in, in 1914, all of these things that he's saying, what does that all have to do with fascism? What does all that have to do? What, what, what does, what does the war machine have to do with authoritarianism? Um, and the, dis and, and what does the dismantling of democracy abroad have to do with the dismantling of democracy at home? Um, and uh, for that, um, I, I, you know, I turned to, um, uh, you know, great sources from, from uh, uh, especially from, you know, the, the, the mid to late 20th century, um, Franz Fanon, uh, who writes, uh, you know, what is, what is fascism, but colonialism practiced in the heart of a traditionally colonialist country, um, the writings of, of uh, Amé Césaire, um, and, and, you know, uh, theorists of fascism, um, uh, you know, who, who are writing to, to the present day. And, uh, and, 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 you know, the answer, uh, it w w was, was cl clear to me, um, and became clearer the, the, you know, the, the, the more I, I looked into the details, um, that essentially without putting too fine a point on it, that what happens is, uh, imperialism, and the dismantling of, uh, of democracy abroad, the subjugation of uh, peoples abroad uh, in whatever state of government that they're in when, 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 when we invade, um, the dehumanization um, and the, uh, uh, and you know, specifically in, in, in the case of the United States, the, the motivation is always uh, in, in these uh, 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 imperial adventures. Um, is, is always at least significantly informed by profit. 
um, as Butler said, it's, it is significantly informed by a, a need to uh, corner the market on resources, cr- you know, o- pry open new markets, um, uh, destroy uh, uh, rivals, um, both political and, and economic, um, and so on. That what happens is we get so good at doing dehumanization and and using force um, to tell people how they will live um, or die um, uh, abroad um, that at some point uh, and and oftentimes at many points along the way um, it comes back home and um, it comes back home in the form of uh, dehumanizing our neighbors. Um, it comes back. It comes back home in, in the form of of looking for um, enemies um, to uh, uh, scaremonger about, uh, to uh, persecute. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dean was talking about um, uh, uh, it's it's pride. Um, uh, Christopher Rufo, um, I think, just last week uh, gave an interview on on Tucker Carlson. Um, where he was essentially saying, and, and Christopher Rufo, for those of you who don't know, he's he's he is um, the a, a he's a, a, a right wing think tanker um, uh, from the Manhattan Institute, um, who is really much more responsible than anybody else for creating the, the panic over um, critical race theory um, that emerged after the George Floyd uprising in in in, in 2020, um, and he is now um, you know playing a, a major and very central role in stoking uh, this, this panic about uh, trans people, um, LGBTQ plus people in general. Um, and, you know, he just gave uh, an interview, I think it was on Tucker a week or two ago, um, you know, where he basically was saying, you know, like, you know, I think that this, I think that this, you know, you know, lavender panic uh, he didn't use those words, but like, yeah, I, I, you know, th- this fear mongering about uh, gender and sexuality um, could be even more effective for us uh, than um, uh, than racism. And, you know, Rufo and, and, the, and, and the Republican Party and, and American conservatives in general um, are just as as Jerry Maguire, the bond salesman who, who tried to, to recruit Butler um, into the business plot did, they are researching and taking, uh, and they're looking closely at authoritarian movements all over the world, um, especially in Europe. I mean, you know, CPAC, uh, the, the Conservative uh, Political Action Committee just held their conference in Hungary, in Viktor Orban's Hungary. And Orban uh, is a model of somebody who is using panic about gender, about uh, sexuality, to create a permanent, um, nebulous uh, uh, class of enemies um, in his own country. Um, he, he, he also took his model directly from, from Vladimir Putin. Um, uh, and, and Russia's, Russia's um, uh, I think it's called like an anti, anti-gay propaganda law, uh, I think was, was sort of the Orwellian title that they had, um, which is just used to just, you know, persecute Gay people force gay people out of out of jobs, um, uh, uh, you know, just just terrorize uh, that community in Russia and and give give uh, official state sanction to all forms of of uh, uh, anti gay violence. Orban uh, used that as his model, and Rufo is using that as a model here, and that is that is the model that that Ron DeSantis and Greg Abbott um, and other American politicians are using. What what they're doing is um, they're saying. Uh, and this, this also, uh, you know, uh, uh, fits in with with, uh, with with the panic over over you know uh, critical race theory and so-called critical race theory, just sort of like the the general sort of anti anti racist uh, 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 McCarthyism that, that's that's happening in this country. Um, th- the idea is that the things that we do um, in you know, for instance, the war on terror, right, where we just say like you know, well, you know, Muslims are the enemy; um, they can't be trusted. Um, it's a, their fifth column. Uh, they're they you know they they act like your your neighbor, but they're actually you know planning to 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 kill your family. They're act, actually planning to abduct your children. Uh, they're actually planning as 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 the as as the current panic says uh, with with regard to you know LGBT uh, people. You know they're, that they, that they're groomers, right? That, that that like that they're they are all pedophiles or working for pedophiles or they're part of some pedophile cabal um, that is that is going to steal your children. And so everything is permitted against them. Everything that we do, anything that is done 
uh, as long as it is done um, in the name of 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 of, re of redressing uh, you know past national humiliations. There's that idea again, um, uh, and and uh, uh, you know to, you know to to make America great again. I mean to, to like to 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 restore a uh, imagined um, uh, violent uh, exclusionary. Uh, 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 image of America and, and of, of an idealized past um, that never existed, um, then everything is permitted. Everything is permissible. Because if we use, if we can use drones, right? Uh, my friend uh, Asma Zahra, who, 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 uh, who just uh, uh, um, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize with her colleagues at, at, at the New York Times, uh, they, they did an amazing job of, calculate, of, of calculating the actual toll of the, the drone war, um, just the, 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 the absolute savagery uh, that, that uh, the United States has, has perpetrated against civilians, against children um, uh, in, in the Middle East um, in particular, also in Somalia. Um, if we can do that, right? If we can kill American citizens with drones, if we can just send flying robots halfway across the world um, to to kill people uh, in their homes and in their wedding parties um, and and in their uh, uh, in their cars, and it's okay uh, because because they are part of a a a threat. They are part of it. They are part of a group of undesirables. Um, and, and they are part of they are part of a, a group of people that, that ultimately have no rights um, because because they're trying because they're trying to do unspeakable things to us supposedly. Um, uh, that same logic um, is that that same logic is the heart of of QAnon, right? It's the heart of of the right wing conspiracy theories um, that that animate Trumpism. Uh, it's the heart of what. January 6th was, was all about. Um, there's a great piece that, I mean, it's a very short piece that just sort of um, synthesizes uh, uh, reporting that's come out in, in, in a series of books, um, you know, in the past you know, year or so about, you know, what was actually happening on, on January 6th. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's in the Washington Post. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, oh, and no, I'm trying to remember. I think it's Philip Bump wrote it. Um, but he, he um, I, I tweeted uh, yesterday. So if you go to my Twitter feed, Cats on Earth, you, you'll, you'll see it there. Um, it's very clear what happened there, right? It's, it's that, you know, Trump's advisors, you know, led by John Eastman, um, said this election is illegitimate because it didn't put our leader, the true leader of the true Volk, <laughs> in power. And so everything is permissible. Everything is permissible in order to see to it that the will of the only people who actually count is enacted, um, and they were very explicit about it. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're, you know, Trump is out in public saying, you know, Mike Pence, in his capacity as uh, as as vice president, as 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 a, a, a president of the Senate, um, is you know, is supposedly within his capacity to just throw out the election. Ultimately, just say. These votes don't count because they were for my opponent. And these votes don't count because they were in places where a lot of non-white people live. Uh, they are in places uh, that, that are, are known as, as, you know, they're, they're, they're cosmopolitan, they're urbane. There's a lot of gay people there. There's a lot of Jewish people there. And so like, you know, there's a lot of Muslim people, there are a lot of immigrants there. And so the idea is that like, these votes don't count. The votes of people in Philadelphia can't count. The votes of people in Atlanta can't count because they are others. They are they are a threat. And 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 this coalition that, that Trump has put together is very interesting, but because it, it it it's it has lots of people who have lots of different uh, definitions of what the out group is. S many of those definitions exclude other people who are in the coalition. Right. So you have nativists. You know, you'll you'll have you'll have have uh, uh, you know black nativists um, whose main uh, uh, opposition is to you know uh, immigrants, um, uh, you know aligned with white supremacists whose main opposition is black people, right? And they all sort of hang together uh, 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 uneasily, um, but there are enough of them that 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 they can make a lot of noise. And their idea was, Mike Pence will 
throw out the votes that don't count. Um, and uh, if he thinks of, 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 of uh, uh, going his own way on this, which of course he ultimately did, um, thank God, I, I don't think I would ever have thought, thank God for Mike Pence, but in this case, uh, he, he a stop clock, I guess, but he, he did the right thing. Um, uh, uh, they would they would converge on the Capitol, business plot, cease février style, march on Rome uh, style, um, to to intimidate him, um, and 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 literally, literally, uh, Trump is tweeting while the rioters are breaching the Capitol um, that Mike Pence uh, is you know essentially a traitor. Um, and 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 Trump's tweets are are repeated aloud on bullhorns by the rioters, um, who then start chanting "Hang Mike Pence." Um, this is not possible. This is not possible unless, as a country, there is a baseline of of looking at dehumanization, violence, um, and and murder. Of uh, and the dismantling of, of, of democracies elsewhere um, as acceptable uh, as, as part of the cost of doing business. Um, and again, I mean, you know, there, there, there were more, there were more literal uh, uh, manifestations of this specific, you know, just, just in January 6th than, 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 than I could even count. I mean, that, you know, the, the, um, a friend of mine, a reporter from the Washington Post, hears, um, you know, people chanting for military tribunals. As they are, as they are uh, uh, breaching the Capitol, the the, the QAnoners, um, a, a core part of their ideology, um, it revolves around Guantanamo Bay, um, as you know, and the idea is that liberals, you know, leftists, every anybody who they don't like will be rounded up, and if we aren't, you know, killed here in the streets, um, then we or our leaders or whatever are going to be taken to Guantanamo um, and executed. Uh, because Guantanamo is a black hole. It's a moral black hole. It is a place where all things are permitted. Which brings me back to Smedley Butler, because Smedley Butler's career starts, that's the, the first place that he is deployed, is Guantanamo Bay. And at the age of 16, uh, caught up in, in a war fervor, um, he, you know, he, he joins the Marines and he gets on the boat and he goes to Cuba and the Marines, the first place the Americans landed in Cuba in 1898, the first place the Marines landed was Guantanamo. And that is the reason why Guantanamo is in Americans' hands. And, and, that, and, and its weird status as a place that from the beginning of the founding of the Republic of Cuba, which was done at, you know, under the watchful eye and under the bayonets of occupying American forces, um, it was done by force, one of the things that was a, a condition of the United States allowing Cuba to have its independence that it had been fighting for, for 30 years before we got involved um, was that we got Guantanamo Bay and could do whatever we wanted there. And that is why Guantanamo has the weird status that it does where it's not quite America and it's not quite Cuba and, and the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration could, could claim that uh, it wasn't subject to international law, et cetera. And that's why that's why Guantanamo is Guantanamo. That's the that's the reason why it, it operates. It has it does what it does in the American imagination, and why the QAnoners, honors, um, uh, you know, could could imagine that 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 you know that's a part of their their eschatological fantasy that that, that this is this is the place where, where they will get revenge is basically by literally turning American by turning gay people by turning uh, black people by turning liberals whoever whoever they are imagining is their outgroup. Um, into, I mean, as Muslims who 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 uh, are, are you know part of the forever prison at, at Guantanamo. That prison was actually originally built in the 1990s to house uh, uh, Haitian refugees uh, and Cuban refugees who were trying to reach the United States. Um, but that that th th we we will it, what what they are saying is we will do to you what we do to other people who we don't like because now you're somebody who we don't like, and that's essentially the connection. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, I don't know if I don't I don't know the extent to which um, I would have been able to understand those connections um, uh, to the to the degree that I do, um, if unfortunately we hadn't been living it in, in real time. I mean, Franz Fanon was a brilliant man, 
part of the reason why he he was able to to, to understand intuitively um, the things that he did was because he grew up as a, as a subject person, uh, you know, a, a, a black man uh, in a, a you know French colony under a, a possession of, of France, um, and was able to see with his own eyes, as, as did Amé Césaire, you know, the the things that that it meant to be a a, a colonized person, and Smedley Butler. Um, despite the fact that he was the instrument of imperialism and the instrument of colonization, um, also uh, came to understand um, in a visceral way um, the ways in which this calculus works, um, the ways in which uh, the things that he did uh, in Haiti and in China and in Nicaragua and in the Philippines and et cetera, um, the, the ways in which that uh, then manifested itself um, in, in, the, in the heart of, of, of Washington, D.C., uh, which, you know, brings me back to uh, the epigraph of the book and, 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 and what I was originally, before I had, had any idea of, like, the, the full extent of, of what I was writing. Um, but, you know, I had this, this uh, phrase in my mind. It's a Haitian Creole proverb. Um, By coublier pote maxonger, the one who deals the blow forgets and the one who bears the scar remembers. And this is part of the reason why people in Haiti remember an occupation that Americans don't. Uh, it's part of the reason why someone like uh, uh, you know, Franz Fanon um, uh, understood things at a visceral level that people who have not been on the re receiving end of, of imperialism do not. Uh, uh, why Palestinians, as we were talking about er earlier today, uh, why they understand at a visceral level uh, things that, that, that people who have not been through that uh, do not. And to a certain extent, even Butler uh, and, and veterans like him. Um, bear literal scars of these battles. And while they don't all come to the same, while, while everybody who bears these scars does not necessarily come to the same conclusions, those who do come to the conclusions, I think can often point to their scars, both, both uh, uh, mental, moral, and, and physical um, to, 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 uh, to, to show you know, how they, they, they arrived at, at this understanding. Um, and unfortunately, we as Americans, all of us today, anybody who's paying attention, um, we, are, we are starting to, to uh, uh, develop uh, new new wounds and, and and new scars today. Um, so uh, you know, I, I, my my hope, um, and it is it is a hope that seems more remote every day. Um, but my hope is that um, uh, this could be a moment um, for everybody to uh, take stock of of who we are uh, and and how we got here, uh, the the ways that American power. Uh, was created, the ways American power is propagated, and, and, and the violence that that does to other people and the violence that it is doing to people in, in America today. Um, and to sort of use that kind of um, more holistic understanding and communicate that more holistic understanding to, to, uh, to, to everybody else who, who, who doesn't see it yet um, uh, before it's too late. All right. Sorry, not yet. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it took me a minute to uh, find myself there. Uh, there we go. Oh, now we're here. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan Katz. <laughs> Really, really incredible, incisive, wonderful um, thoughts. And, and I hope we can have a conversation after we hear from David Roth um, for, for one last song. But first, I want to show you this couple of things. First is this book. This is our membership book. It's got uh, about 40 years worth of people who signed up. Um, I go through here and there are some people who signed up decades ago and and I keep trying to maybe get them back involved, like Cole Harrison. Whoa, he signed up in 1977. Maybe we can get Cole to come back. We, we still very much know about Cole and his, and his work at, at MAPA. But uh, um, the years go by, and I want to show you the, the very most recent um, entry is named Amar Ahmad, and he's with us on this Zoom call, and he just joined. And um, and Amar, by by chance, is going to be also working with us on improving the grace, elegance, and style of our broadcast, as well as the um, 
the uh, the outreach to to young people through social media. Uh, Amar Ahmad, welcome to Community Church. We've got you right here, and this is an invitation to any other people who want to either join or get reinvolved again and get on our our membership um, uh, directory and find out again about uh, what's going on with Community Church of Boston, with this building, with this with this community. Um, that's our membership book. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is a beautiful symbol here. It's a basket and it is meant to hypnotize you <laughs> into going to your checkbook and your <laughs> PayPal account and your credit card and your cash app and your whatever app. We need your help. It's, it's with your help that we make these programs happen and we make this community happen. Um, we make our prison membership uh, program happen, our outreach to, to vulnerable communities, um, all, of those, all of those things through your help. And also most, most of all, our attempts to turn this building into a state-of-the-art energy efficient um, model for the city of Boston, which has about 40,000 more commercial buildings like this one that could could use a little bit of guidance on, on what to do. And we're just getting started on that through step by step. Enough of me. So um, you can you can join and we're, we're still finding trying to find a protocol about how to how to join virtually, I guess you could like write your your signature and the date on a on a piece of paper and send it to us through the mail and we would tape it in there and you wouldn't even have to show up this is this is the, the 21st century uh virtual membership um uh, and there's probably a lot of bylaws that we'd have to write to make that happen in in in, in the right way but just just know that that you're welcome here and and we uh encourage you to to get involved um, one, one thing we're working on, just starting to work on, is a, a big gallery display that will happen in this building in the fall, in October, uh, the, the work of the, uh, of the paintings of Diane Esmond, the, the mother of our good friend Victor Wallace. Um, and they will they will grace all of the walls of this auditorium and maybe some other parts of the building like the stairwell and some other unoccupied office space upstairs. And we are going to have a whole weekend of celebrations uh, on on that. And um, and you're welcome to get involved. We used to be a gallery. We used to have three shows a year of the, uh, what was called the Gallery for Social Political Art. Um, and we're trying to get that again. We we're. we're Perfectly located right in the middle of everything here in Copley Square, and it's we're looking forward to this first attempt at, at becoming a gallery. We'll have we'll have a concert here. We'll have a wine and cheese reception. All of that good stuff that that uh, that celebrates art. David Roth, thanks again for joining us. You can find more about David's music at davidrothmusic.com. And, um, and he's got an incredible catalog of wonderful stuff you can hear online. And he's with us here now for one last song. Thank you again, David, for being with us today. It's my pleasure, Dean, and a pleasure to hear Jonathan as well. Amazing work you all are doing. And Dean, I must just say, I just have always admired how you walk in this world. So thank you for that. As we come around to take our places at the table A moment to remember and reflect upon our wealth Here's to loving friends and family And here's to being able To gather here together in good company and health And may we be released from all those feelings that would harm us May we have the will to give them up and get them gone For heavy are the satchels, full of anger and false promise May we have the strength to put them down and May the light of love be shining deep within your spirit May the torch of mercy clear the path and show the way 
May the horn of plenty sound so everyone can hear it. May the light of love be with you every day. And may we wish the best for everyone that we encounter. May we swallow pride and may we do away with fear. For it's only what we do not know that we have grown afraid of and only what we do not choose to hear. May the light of love be shining deep within your spirit. May the torch of mercy clear the path and show the way. May the horn of plenty sound so everyone can hear it. May the light of love be with you every day, every day. And as we bless our daily bread and drink our day's libation, may we be reminded of the lost and wayward soul hungry and the homeless that we have in every nation, may we fill each empty cup and bowl. May nothing ever come between or threaten to divide us. May we never take for granted all the gifts that we receive. Being ever mindful of the unseen hands that guide us and the miracles that cause us to believe. May the light of love be shining deep within your spirit. May the torch of mercy clear the path and show the way. May the horn of plenty sound so everyone can hear it. May the light of love be with you every day. The horn of plenty sound so everyone can hear it. May the light of love be with you. May the light of love be with you. May the light of love be with you. Every day. David Roth, thank you. That is a song for the ages, and it's a song that we've sung at our Thanksgiving table, and, uh, and thanks for writing it, and thanks for being with us today. David Roth, folks, it's just beautiful. Um, I want to I wanna recognize uh, all of the Smedley Butler folks who are with us today. Pat Scanlon, who had to go, he went to uh, to the Pride uh, uh, service at Arlington Street Church, which is just two blocks away. Also, Robert Morris, who is with us today, and uh, Joe Cabardis, who is also with us. Let me, uh, there's Joe. And um, uh, Joan Livingston, who's also very active with Vets for Peace, as well as, I don't, I'm not sure that he's here, but Homer, uh, Homer is here. I see him. Hello, Homer. And um, Jim Kasteris, who is a long time, very active with Vets for Peace Smedley Butler Brigade. Um, Jim is, uh, uh, are you here? If you are, there he is. All right. Glad you're on board with us, Jim. All right. All right, and if there's anybody that I that I I missed that is uh, active with Vets for Peace, uh, please chime in. A actually, David Rothhauser is with us as well, and uh, Phil Noyce he raised his hand. And this is this is a marvelous uh, assemblage of folks that we have a long association with, and are very proud to have uh, done a lot of uh, programming. With, with folks from, from Vets for Peace. Um, keep it up and, and don't stop for, forever and for a long time. So we have time for um, some questions and answers or some observations. If anybody wants to either raise your little digital hand or, or, or put something in the chat. Uh, I, I'm gonna go through the chat in a bit, but um, Robert has, has his hand up and go ahead, why don't you, uh, Come on up here, Robert. Let's 
Well, Mr. Katz, I just want to thank you for that fabulous presentation and the work you're doing. <laughs> I want to say a few things. Uh, in hearing about the book, we had had a visitor a few years ago at Veterans for Peace, that's where I am, and we had that in Cambridge. And he was writing a book about Smedley. Uh, his name is Joseph Franzak from Princeton University. I have to make a joke about it. I thought this was his book. Mm -hmm. But this is the difference between a journalist and a professor. You did the research and published the book. He did the research. He's still thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's not there. <laughs> but uh, you kind of alluded to what I was thinking as you talked. We went from history, Smedley Butler, up to the present, to the very present, and maybe not to this morning, if you heard MSNBC and you heard Peter Navarro uh, talking bug-eyed information, as they said. Uh, where are the historians right now? And I may, this may not be intellectually possible. Where are the historians right now putting all this timeline in place about what's going on right now? Because for a person like myself and maybe a lot of veterans for peace, we can't keep up with the disinformation as well as the information. So that historians, of course, sift the wheat from the chaff. And we need that now also, a running timeline, if you will, of what's going on. Because one person on the uh, TV or the internet said, a coup cannot happen here because the military will never agree, the citizens will never agree. Who knows if that's possible? Uh, where is the historians right now? There are a lot of great historians out there. Uh, how can they deal with that problem that people like I, like myself, need information? And the other thing is maybe you could do a book signing up in Cambridge with us at Porter Square Books or Harvard Bookstore when you have a chance. Uh, that would be wonderful if you came up and visited us. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. I'd love to do that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So that's my question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, you know, speaking as a journalist, I mean, you know, the, the, the old um, camera, Ben Bradley or Catherine Grand line about, you know, journalists write the first draft of history. Um, you know, you know, th things that are happening in, in real time, um, you know, I can tell you, cause my, my wife is a, is a professional historian. She's a, she has a PhD, um, you know, the, the, it, it, I, I, disciplinarily, Historians tend to only get involved, you know, at, a, at sort of at a minimum, like, you know, 30, 30, 40 years after an event um, in which, you know, they, they try to put it in context. I mean, there are historians who are sort of, you know, in the arena, so to speak. Um, you know, Kevin Cruz at, at Princeton is one. Um, and uh, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, uh, a friend of mine here in town, uh, David Walsh, who, 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 um, uh, he's, he's sort of a, a, a you know an active uh, public intellectual who, who talks about these things in real time and is a is a scholar of of uh, the far right um, and authoritarianism. Um, uh, not a historian, but um, uh, well, Kathleen Kathleen Ballou, um, I think she is a historian. Um, she has a great book um, that she just uh, put out. It's right here. A Field Guide to White Supremacy. Um, she co-edited it with uh, Ramon Gutierrez. Um, uh, that came out, I think a couple, this is a, an advanced copy, but I think it came out last year. Yeah, it came out in 2021. Um, she, she, uh, she's, she, she's an expert on uh, the white power movement. Um, I mean, again, you know, she, she, she tends to write about um, you know, the eighties and the nineties, um, uh, but, you know, you know, takes things, you know, uh, current um, and, and, and talks about them in an intellectual frame. She, she does, you know, guest essays and things like that in the times. So she, she, she's out there. Um, you know, there, I mean, there are, there are people um, it's a lot, to, as you say, like, it's a lot to, it's a lot to, um, to suss out. I mean, you know, for me personally, um, you know, speaking as sort of a, a you know, a journalist who, who plays historian, um, uh, you know, disinformation is a problem. Um, but, you know, it's, it is not a, 
from 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 an individual research standpoint, um, at you know, again, it's maybe maybe even this is you know more more putting on my journalist hat. Um, it's not an insurmountable problem, um, you know. As as a like I'm I'm used to, and I've I've done this all over the world and in multiple languages, um, having people. Uh, uh, BS me. I know we're in church, so I don't, I feel like I shouldn't cuss, but like, but you know, I, 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 um, you know, I, I, people, people try to gaslight me about all kinds of things, um, and have all kinds of, you know, uh, assumptions and folk beliefs and things that, you know, people just sort of like are going around and saying, um, you know, that's not a new issue that, that, that happens, that happens all the time. Um, and, and, and the cure for that from, you know, speaking from like the sp- standpoint of an individual researcher, is to like apply rigor, um, you know, be like, you know, can I see the document? Can I see the timestamp? Do you have a recording of this? Is there video of this? Is there photos of this? Um, who else was there? Um, asking questions. Where were you before that? Like what, you know, what, and, and so, you know, w- w- like with regard to January 6th, you know, specifically, um, you know, there are, you know, th- these are things that are measurable. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's useful to know the conspiracy theories. It's useful to know the things that, that people are, are, are telling each other, um, and, and, and are out there, but then, but then you, but then you dig in, then you say like, okay, well, where's, where's the evidence for this claim? Um, you know, maybe there is, maybe there, you know, like, is there like a secret, you know, like is America run by a secret, secret cabal of, of, of pedophiles who are, who are just trying to, you know, steal everybody's children and drink their blood? Okay, like where's your evidence for that? Um, it's, that's, not a hard, that's not a hard thing to, 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 to disprove um, because A, because it's not happening, but B, because, because there's no evidence for it. So you can just say, all right, this is a claim made without evidence and claims without evidence can, you know, can, can to a certain extent be, be, be uh, uh, dismissed. Um, if not without evidence, but, but, you know, using the lack of evidence as, as evidence of itself. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I would say like, there are people out there who are, who are trying to do this work. Um, it is not impossible work, um, but there are big headwinds uh, because it's one thing, is one thing for Kathleen Ballou to write, um, you know, a field guide to white supremacy um, that lays out um, the ways in which, you know, these arguments and uh, great replacement theory, you know, the, 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 um, the, the belief that, that, in, that, that inspired the, the, the massacre in Buffalo a couple of weeks ago, et cetera. Um, like it's, it's one thing to sort of lay out like, oh, you know, this goes back to, you know, this, this, you, you can trace this back to Madison Grant and Teddy Roosevelt. Somebody's mentioned in the chat, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, you know, ab, you know absolute adamant white supremacists, um, you know, and through the present day, and here's, and then it goes through George Lincoln Rockwell, and then it goes, you know, then it goes to the Aryan nations, and then it ends up in this book in France, and like, you can, you can, you can, like, you can, you can, you know, trace these things fairly easily. Um, it's a whole other thing to communicate that to a, a wider public and, um, and convince them, um, you know, plug for journalists, as you noted, like, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, because 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 maybe we're 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 more trained to um, just get get the thing out there, uh, imperfect as it may be, um, in a way that 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 uh, you know disciplinary historians are not. Um, maybe you know in, in in real time that is more of a job for journalists. But 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 for me personally, um, it's uh, uh, you know we we can't do it alone, um, and uh, and and historians can't do it alone either. And so I, I think that we all need to be working. Thank you very much. Thank you. Charlie, you're next. Go ahead. Um, hi, it's Karen. Or so Karen. Charlie, yeah, yes, hi. it's Charlie Karen. Charlie has uh, something he's going to show you. Um, okay, so over 30 years ago when I was married, uh, my husband got uh, some information about Smed- uh, Smedley Butler and the brigade in Boston. Thank you, Jim Casteris and others in the group. Um, so uh, that's his cap. Uh, He's now out of the Boston area, but we learned an awful lot about Smedley Butler, an awful lot about American history through Smedley Butler and reading about him. So I want to congratulate you on your book, Jonathan, and thank you very much for writing it. And thank you very much for uh, presenting uh, your point of view. And yes, please come to Cambridge (laughs) and have book signing. 
Um, the second, second thing I wanted to say is that I don't know if everyone online here knows that a couple of days ago, the, the People's Forum in New York City was uh, essentially invaded by 12 or more New York police, armed and whatever. And with them came about a half a dozen, a dozen right-wingers, <laughs> folks who want the U.S. to invade again Cuba, invade Venezuela, invade Nicaragua, whatever. Uh, they wore the um, MAGA hats, M-A-G-A hats, and they carried signs and posted, and they paraded around inside the People's Forum, which is a wonderful place. It's a first floor entry um, for um, you know, various uh, forums and talks. Um, and it was, it was uh, defended by those people who were there. They locked arms and um, chanted, uh, uh, you know, against these, this invasion. But the fact that the New York police were in there, a dozen of them, not one or two, but about a dozen in this photo. So I encourage people to go to the site and to and, uh, add your support to the People's Forum. Thank you. Thank you. That is really disturbing news, um, especially because, uh, you know, compare community church in many ways to the People's Forum. Uh, we are uh, uh, right in the heart of downtown, kind of in a way a thorn in the side of, of, the, of many things in the city and in, in the side of, of the, 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 the capitalism all around it. You know, we're in a high fashion, uh, very fancy uh, district, and um, and it's it's really disturbing that that happened. And I want to find out more about it and express our solidarity about that. Karen, thank you. Any any response about that, Jonathan? Or uh, it sounds bad. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, very briefly. And by the way, I'm going to have to run in a second because I need to. I'm, I'm on on. I'm, I'm the primary uh, child caregiver today. Oh. Um, but. Um, uh, the one thing I would say is is that um, we, we we also saw in in uh, Uvalde, um, Texas, um, the cops and uh, and right wing paramilitaries um, working hand in hand, um, which is a thing that happens. Um, and um, I mean, again, you know, um, just like, just as in a, any other part of this uh, uh, any any movement period, um, sometimes they are working across purposes. Sometimes they are they're enemies of each other. Um, it was obviously cops fighting against uh, uh, the rioters on, on January 6th, but, um, but we do see that and, 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 and there's a long and storied history of that in, um, uh, in the history of fascism, um, uh, you know, whether it's Squadrissi in, in, in Italy or, or the Freikorps in, 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 in Germany, um, or, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the plenty of examples in, in, in the United States as well. Um, including the Klan and, and others. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's disturbing, um, and, uh, but it also scans, <laughs> is what I would say. I, can, I think I could take maybe one more question. I just, I have to run because my, my, my child needs me. Okay, uh, go ahead, Victor. And, uh, and thank you for that. And uh, let folks know also that um, if you want to be a scholar of uh, fascism, uh, uh, come to Community Church. We inherited an enormous number of books from Bob D'Atilio, many of them about Mussolini, fascism, and the origins of fascism and, and Nazism as well. So um, go ahead, Victor, one, one last question for Jonathan. We can continue talking, but we really thank you, Jonathan, for, for joining us and uh, go ahead, Victor. Thank you very much for this presentation. I've always been interested in this case. I, I thought you might be interested in knowing, and I wonder if this is generally known, I had a student recently, a Marine veteran uh, in his late twenties, uh, coming back to school, uh, who told me that part of the Marine training, he, he himself is very progressive. Part of the Marine training includes uh, the whole story of Smedley Butler. I was amazingly surprised to hear that that's part of the official curriculum. In any case, I'm, I'm curious about it. But uh, my general question is, uh, if there were any, in when you research your, the life of Smedley Butler, whether you found any misgivings that he felt along the way before he finally did his 180 degree turn after his retirement? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so I would say very briefly, um, 
uh, in, in terms of Marine training. Um, it sort of depends on, 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 on where you're a Marine and which Marine, you know, what part of the training you're talking about. I think officially, generally, the, the only thing they learn is, is the two medals of honor. Um, two, two, they, they, they say two medal, two Marines, two medals of honor, and, and the answers are, are Smedley Butler and Dan Daly, and that's often all they know. Unofficially, um, I, I definitely have friends and people who've, who've gone through the Corps um, who get sort of at least, you know, war as a racket passed around to them, sometimes by their CO, um, sometimes sometimes while they're for, forward deployed. Um, so there, there's a tradition of, of, of handing those stories down. It's not necessarily official, um, but, but, but uh, it, it happens so often that I, I have to wonder if it's sort of, you know, un, unofficially official. Um, and, and Marine Corps University actually had me, um, had me talk so that they, they, they're interested in this stuff. And, and um, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, 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 culture in the Marine Corps. Um, uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, his misgivings across his life, um, I think that there are a couple different points along the way where it starts sort of peeking out. Um, one of the big ones is in Nicaragua, uh, where I was talking about earlier when, when you know, he's, he's there um, in uh, 1909, 1910, 1912. Um, and uh, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's one of the first times that he really talks about in his letters home to his parents. He's a prolific letter writer to his mother, especially who saved all of his letters, it seems. Um, uh, he talks about um, how, you know, he, th that as he sees it, um, he and his Marines are there just, you know, um, uh, you know, serving the interests of Wall Street, essentially, um, and, 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 and American miners, um, and, and, th and that there's no, you know, revolutionary sentiment, uh, supposedly, that, that, that they're uh, um, uh, defending. I think that part of the reason why he says that in, in Nicaragua, or why he comes to that conclusion in Nicaragua for the first time, the first time that you could, it really shows up in his in his thinking, um, is because uh, he's just become a major, um, and he's able to he's he's a flag officer and he's able to 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 uh, leave the ship and give himself orders about who where he goes to and and and, and who he talks to, um, and, and so the, for the for the first time um, in his career he's really talking to like a wide variety of people, um, Nicaraguans. Um, American, you know, wildcat financiers who've, who've come down and, and all of them, as he says, you know, have their ideas of, of what the Marines should do. It's also important to note that he, that this doesn't change anything that he does in Nicaragua, despite the, despite the fact that he's, he's becoming self-critical. Um, he, 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 he goes on uh, in Nicaragua and then it's after Nicaragua that he, he really, you know, some, many of Butler's, you know, greatest hits. Um, you know, the invasion of Mexico, the, the massacre at Fort Riviera in, in, in Haiti, the, the dismantling of the Haitian parliament, all of that happens after this. So it's, it's an example of, 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 you know, being inside the machine. And, and even though you, you, you start to, 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 to get notions about um, self-critical notions about, you know, what you're doing wrong, um, it doesn't necessarily stop you from doing it. Um, the only time uh, I think that Butler is in uniform um, and actually, you know, puts any degree of, of this sort of, you know, budding realization um, into action um, is in China, um, his last deployment overseas in the late 1920s, uh, 1927, 1929. Um, uh, and, and what's happening there is, first of all, uh, one of the major things that's happened in between is World War I. Um, he's seen the, hor the, the horrors of, of modern warfare in a way that he hadn't experienced yet. Nobody really had experienced yet um, in, in, um, in these so-called small wars um, in, in Latin America and in Asia. Um, uh, you know, he sees, you know, the, um, he sees the, uh, the, the, the disfigurement of, of the veterans uh, uh, who, who are coming back, uh, the active duty who are, who are coming back from the front lines, et cetera. And he sees how horrific uh, a world war can be. Um, and he's now a general. So he, now, now, now not only is he deciding who to talk to, um, he's deciding actually what the troops can do and what, what, what the strategy is going to be. Um, and, it's, and it's in China. And I talk about this in it's the Shanghai chapter of the book. I think it's chapter 16. Um, uh, he's actually taking active steps there as a general um, to keep his Marines out of combat um, and, uh, and, and prevent really the outbreak of, of what he sees as a coming uh, Sino-Japanese war, which of course then happens. Um, again, he's still part of the machine. Uh, the things that he and his Marines do in China at that moment help 
you know, create the rest of the 20th century um, in China. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I'll, 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 but I'll, I'll leave it at that. It, 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 this is the reason why I'm saying that, like, it's not just like a, it's not just like a Volta. It's not just like a, 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 an immediate turn. Um, you know, these things are, are coming up slowly in different ways over the course of his career. Um, but as one does, and this is true for all of us, uh, you know, being when you're in the machine and we're all in the machine to some extent, um, you know, even becoming self-critical and, and, and self-aware um, does not necessarily, um, that's not necessarily enough to, 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 pre to prevent harm. And I, I'm sorry, guys, I really have to go. I, I really apologize. Hey, Jonathan, thank you so much. This has been rich and, and just great for our hunger to learn about this era and to learn about Smedley Butler. We're proud to have this book in our library and hope you will join us in person to, to sign the book and, and maybe uh, give another talk about whatever else you're, you're, you're studying whenever you're able to get up this way. Um, uh, and we will say thank you and goodbye everybody. Just uh, thank you so much. And, and, and I, I will um, say um, I, I, have a, I have a newsletter. Uh, it's called The Racket for obvious reasons. Uh, you can find it at theracket.news. Uh, dot N-E-W-S. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you, you can, there's paid subscriptions available there as well, but you, but you can, you can sign up for free. Um, and that's a way to, to, to be in touch with what I'm doing and uh, any questions that I didn't have a chance to, to get to. Um, uh, you can, you can reply to my next uh, uh, newsletter and, and I'll try to answer them there. Let, let me know that you were here and that I didn't have a chance to answer you, your question. But, okay. but thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you, Jonathan. And let's continue with, uh, with, with the conversation. Um, I want to recognize Barry Warner, who is a, another vet for peace, who is, who is with us uh, on, on the call. He's, he's, he's calling us from Chicago, uh, although he does live in, in Cambridge, but uh, also spends time in Chicago. Um, Mike Hoshman, you're next. Thank Will you. you join us? Hi, Mike. Good thank to see you. Ya. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Dean, for continuing the discussion. Uh, I'm definitely going to read the book. I'm reading a, another book right now, uh, The Plot to Seize the White House in the 1930s, uh, which is about Smedley Butler. Um, I, I really liked uh, uh, the author's uh, ability to make connections between then and now. Uh, and that's what I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about. Um, fascism, fascism is horrible. It's unacceptable. Uh, neoliberalism, uh, well, that's, in my opinion, fascism with a smile, and it's tolerable. So as bad as Trump is and the Republicans are, and they are, I just want to point out a couple of other things. It's like the war in Ukraine, you know? <laughs> Uh, where's the upsurge? Where's where where is the resistance to that? You know, I'm part of it, but it's small, it's tiny, and I know people in community church are against it. It's it's a war that's waged by the neoliberal Biden uh, with the support of all the Democratic members of Congress. He wanted thirty billion dollars, and he got forty billion dollars. And the only people who voted against it. We're really Republicans. We're some Republicans, including some really crazy Republicans, too. And Trump spoke against it. And I just can't imagine that we would be at war with uh, with uh, uh, Russia right now if Trump were the president instead of Biden. Uh, for whatever his crazy reasons were, uh, uh, whatever. But, you know, at the same time that we're uh, uh, at war with Russia, it's not enough for Biden. Now, now we're moving towards war with China. You know, it's like Taiwan. It's like, and again, he said, you know, you go after Taiwan. He's daring the Chinese to do something. So uh, it's like, that's, that's the comments that I want to make. It's like, I, I think that, yes, we should always be horrified. And we should always be horrified, not only by the fascists, but by the neoliberals who are fascists with a smile. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Homer. Hi, Homer. Uh, hi. Uh, I guess, uh, oh, unable to unmute myself. All right. You're me. We can hear you. We hear you. Okay. Uh, I, I have I have a question that I, I want to share with everybody. I would I would have liked to have asked uh, Jonathan Katz that, 
uh, this question. Uh, I, well, first, a, a couple of words about the uh, the book. Um, I got the book because it was a promotional uh, offering uh, in uh, fundraising for uh, Free Speech TV, which I want to recommend. Uh, and uh, it's an this is an important book. Uh, I think it goes alongside the works of Chomsky and Zinn in American history, carefully documented. And the bibliography could fur furnish as a foundation for a, a, a degree program in a university. So, you know, it's an important book. Uh, I got the, but I got the book in particular because I wanted to know more about Smedley Butler and uh, his transformation. Um, you know, it's a tantalizing uh, fact that he was raised as a Quaker. And uh, so, and what was, what was his relationship uh, ongoing with Quakerism, uh, if any. Um, uh, but really, uh, uh, what I wanted to know about Sw Smedley Butler, and um, which I don't think is in the book, um, is, is did he have uh, ever any kind of spiritual awakening uh, or transformation involved in this? Or was it just uh, a recognition of the scales falling from your eyes and recognition of the fallacies of neoliberalism and uh, uh, and the mistakes that the the pragmat the progressive pragmatism that was being practiced at the time still is uh, is is there was there anything at, at all uh, in regarding uh, spiritual awakening uh, or was it just uh, you know uh, real politics that emerged finally in him so I'm I'm gonna. I'd like to take that up with Jonathan Katz, and I probably will in uh, the racket.news newsletter. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Homer. That's that's a good question, one that I had, too. Um, his relationship with Quakerism. Um, uh, it's not and, in the book. Uh, yeah, it, it, it doesn't. I, I haven't gotten as far as you have in the book, uh, but that's a good one, too. To take up with Jonathan, um, I can I can send you his email address as well if you're interested, um, or or through his 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 uh, podcast. Um, so uh, that's that's a very good question, uh, kind of like the questions that they asked about Richard Nixon's Quakerism. Um, uh, I think it's about it's a valuable book uh, in 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 the historical context, and it certainly is uh, contemporary history. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it doesn't do much for uh, uh, my uh, spiritual journey. Yeah. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, Robin. Yeah. Thank you, Hi, Robin. Uh, Robin, welcome. Uh, um, yeah. Thank you. How uh, are you? I put, okay. I put I put my question in the chat a little while ago. It, it's about. Uh, you know, what drives the, these uh, gangsters of capitalism? It turns out that personality has been proven to be mostly Thank you. genetic. And we have a certain number of narcissists and sociopaths. And, uh, you know, they, they're driven to take control. They think they're wonderful and they deserve all its money and power. They don't care about the little people and don't mind uh, hurting other people. And so the big problem with, with the human species is these people take over in the corporations and the governments frequently. And I've written about uh, 50 ways that the corporations are screwing the American people. And also about how the vast majority of people are totally conformist. They just go along with whatever everyone else in their perceived tribe or, or whatever is doing. And they're gullible and, you know, like, like I was, at least 10 or 15 environmental crimes alone that corporations are committing. Anyway, other people uh, you know, want to get more involved in the underlying causes of our human problems. Yeah, thanks, Robin. Thanks. Um, uh, let's see. I'm looking in the... Um, Butler's called a fighting Quaker, Joan says. Uh, and... Um, and again, more references to Biden and um, uh, David Roth uh, had to had to get off and uh, says thank you for for this talk and um, I hope he will join us again soon. Um, uh, 
Yeah, uh, Joan, we have we have the book War is a Racket right here. Um, it's it's in our library. Come come have a look. And anybody else who wants to get a tour of of, of our library that we're just setting up and, and and putting out and trying to organize, come on by on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. Uh, Crystal and I are here. Uh, let's see. Is there anyone else who can join us? Ken, how are you? I'm okay. Thank you. All right. Um, it occurred to me, I don't know how many people heard Chomsky's statement about Ukraine, where he was saying that uh, Trump was the only one who could negotiate um, peace in the Ukraine. And that obviously, you know, um, Chomsky, Chomsky also urged people to vote for, for Biden as opposed to Trump. So the question then becomes, why would Chomsky, who is presumably an anti-fascist, make the statement about Trump in the Ukraine? Maybe it's pragmatic on uh, Chomsky's part in terms of Trump. Um, when he started his campaign, said, why can't we just uh, get along with Russia? Um, and then, of course, there was the entire Russiagate, it, you know, um, the entire Russia gate, whatever we want to call it, um, which was set up to uh, kind of uh, hobble Trump. Um, is Trump simply coming from a nativist America first um, point of view in terms of Ukraine and, and, and Russia just stay out of foreign involvements, uh, America first? Or was there some sort of um, side to Trump, which was just saying, look, let's Let's just get along with people in the rest of the world, et cetera, et cetera, which would be to a certain extent, I suppose, anti-imperialist. I'm not making a case for Trump at all. I think Trump did try to overthrow the election and uh, had an authoritarian uh, streak. But it, it is a little bit of a, a question, I guess. And I don't know if Trump, uh, Trump's 